Renee, you are the first guest that I've ever had on the show that's in the Atlantic time zone. This was very confusing for me to book this. C'est la vie. <laughs> Très bien. Wait, so you're living in New Brunswick now? No. Yeah. So for Americans who might be watching this, that's like Maine and then a little bit further north? Oh, yeah. Yeah, we, we border Maine. Okay, so Maine. you border Maine. You also well, border live, Quebec, though. Yeah. How, well, how long has it been now? Right, was that? How long has it been now since you've been back in Canada? Well, I moved back here in 2007. Mm -hmm. Then I traveled around. I lived in Japan for about three years. Right. And I toured all over Europe. But I always try to come back home, right? Yeah, well, I, I hear you. There's nothing like Canada. I love Canada, dude. Yeah, it's, al it's always good to talk to a fellow Canadian. I'm sorry that my French is very, very limited to high school French, which is not helpful in a conversation at all. That's okay. I, I rarely even speak French anymore, only with my dad. Really? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Like, in, they teach you in high school to, like, conjugate verbs, which, you know, it serves no purpose in real life, I feel like. There's a lot of stuff I learned in school that serves no purpose, man. <laughs> I'm so curious to dive into your whole story here. But uh, before we get into all of that, congrats on your new podcast. Thanks. Well, I got a lot of downtime. And then this, this guy from uh, UK was like, he, he interviewed me for his podcast. That yeah. night he's wrestling. Got to give it a cheap plug. Yeah, James. And he said, yeah, James. And then he said, well... Would you be interested in doing one? And I was like, well, I got nothing but time on my hands since I can't travel anywhere, right? Right. So, yeah, it's it's actually pretty fun. It's, it keeps me updated what's going on in wrestling because otherwise I'd have no clue because I, I don't watch it on TV anymore, right? I find that to be such an interesting thing. So many guys, after they have left the business or left WWE, don't watch wrestling that much anymore. What, what do you think it is about that? I think you get sick of it. <laughs> you get burnt out when you're there. Oh, no, seriously. Yeah. You get so burnt out because when you're in that system, it's like 24-7, right? Yeah. I mean, you're technically an independent contractor, but really you're on call 24-7. You know? So is this the idea that you've seen how the sausage is made and maybe now you don't like eating sausage so much anymore? Well, like now I follow the Japanese stuff because that's where I've been based for Christ going on 15 years now, right? Yeah. So, like, now I'm with a company called Pro Wrestling Noah, and they're about to start a, a feud with New Japan Pro Wrestling, interpromotional feud. And uh, if it wasn't for these freaking lockdowns, I'd be there right now, a part yeah. of it. And, when you uh, look at the New Japan roster, who are you like, oh, man, I need to have a match with this person? Well, I wrestled pretty much fuck, three quarters of the roster already because I was in all Japan Pro Wrestling. I was there with right. Sonata. Bushi, uh, Minoru Suzuki, Kojima. So I wrestled all those guys before, but like the guys I haven't wrestled would be Okada, Tanahashi, uh, Naito. Uh, I like to get that. Have you worked Osprey yet? Uh, no, no. I know exactly what I would do with them, though. I mean, I'm not going to divulge my secrets here on this, uh, but I know what, you know, like I compare them to like a Paul London. You remember Paul London? Yeah, of course. Yeah, so I I could have so much fun with those guys. Let's just put it that way. Yeah, I love it. Yeah. You know, if, if if hardcore wrestling fans are watching this or listening to this right now, they'll recognize the name of your podcast, Cafe de Rene, which yeah. was a very, very short-lived talk show <laughs> in WWE. <laughs> I think it, we had like one in-ring uh, in uh, session and then like some backstage stuff. No, nah, that was just created by one of the writers. And then uh, I didn't even name it. it was my co-host had decided to call it that. I was like, okay, go ahead. I mean, it makes sense, right? Yeah, I'll probably rename it here eventually. It's Coffee with Renee, right? Yeah, yeah. See, my high school French is kicking in here. <laughs> <laughs> it was worth something. Why didn't it last longer in WWE? I don't know. Maybe they didn't like it. Who knows? Yeah. I mean, you're, you're working for Vince McMahon. The guy changes his mind like he changes his underwear, right? <laughs> so, you know. We, I mean, obviously you're not in it now, but would you say that's gotten better 
or worse as Vince has gotten older? Do you watch the product? Yeah, I probably watch it about as much as you're watching it. Right now. <laughs> okay, <laughs> listen. If I if I'm not a fan of something, I yeah. can't I can't fake it. I can't pretend that it's great. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like I get asked all the time, "Would you go back?" Well, number one, would they have me back? Which is probably no, because I've been outspoken, mm. right? But number two, it's like, dude, I can't even watch the show. Yeah. So like. And I know, I know the process that goes into it. It's not what I grew up, you know, it's not what I was brought into the process. Yeah. It's more Hollywood now. You know what I mean? Yeah. Well, it's a television show and I think people always forget it's a television yeah. show. Yeah. At what point in your career did you start to be okay with being outspoken about this stuff? <sighs> Honestly? Yeah. My friends started dying. Wow. That's when I lost it, you know, because when I literally, when I left, I was, you know, being professional and like, it's a great company. I just, you know, want to do something else. But then when it actually happened, my friend Lance Cade passed away at age 29 of an overdose, you know, I just mm. snapped. But that, uh, I'm glad that that has kind of decreased as far as guys dying young. It's kind of gotten better, you know. At one point, man, it's like every other month you'd have a guy just drop dead, you know? Especially the years that I was there. I was there from 2002 to 2007. Yeah. Those are like the worst years, right? Yeah, when you look at that time, I mean, just off the top of my head, I can already think of like eight to 10 people who passed yeah. away far too soon. Yeah. What do you think it, it is or it was? Drugs. Hmm. Opioids. Are we, are we talking like hard drugs? Or are we talking steroids? We're talking opiates. Yeah. Right now, unless you're living under a rock, the North America has a serious, serious uh, opioid addiction pandemic. Yeah. Uh, it's it's a it's it's out of control. Yeah. You know, and then you put yourself in a position where your job is being at that time being bashed over the head with chairs. And they still go through tables, which they overdo it to death. It means nothing anymore. And, you you know, and you had no time off. And at that time, you were scared to lose your spot. And I can remember a fellow Canadian, Andrew Martin. Remember him? Test, yeah. Yeah. When he broke his neck, they fired him. So what kind of message does that send to the rest of your locker room, right? You could even show that you were in pain because then you may think, oh, well, we can't push this guy because, you know, he might, he might fall off the radar. He might get injured. And then there goes, our, you know, it's all about money, right? TV time is money, right? Yeah. So that's when guys would, you know, and here's the thing that people don't realize, or maybe they do. All it takes is seven to 10 days of consistent usage of an opioid and you're, you're hooked. Your, your body becomes physically dependent on it. Right? So if you got a torn knee and you take the stuff and you're, you're still working every night and you take that stuff for 30, 40, 60 days, when you try to get off of it, you can't. Yeah. You're hooked. You know? Is this something that you struggled with? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, because the first time I got introduced to it was my first month in the United States because I got sent to developmental, right? Yeah. Which was in Cincinnati. And uh, OVW, I did die. Right? No, no, this was HWA, Heartland oh, Wrestling okay. Association. Yeah. So I, I, we had a practice match, and I did a dive in the corner, and I hit the, the steel ring post, and I uh, broke all four of my front teeth. Gone. We were actually like chipped in half, and it was brutal, right? Well, you have a great dentist because this is tremendous work here. Well, I had him replaced three times. But <laughs> three times. So then I went to the dentist and he gave me a bottle of Vicodin. No. Mm. So that, and if you like, I, I follow like uh, intervention. You ever watch that TV show? Yeah, of course. And, yeah. A lot of people, a lot of their stories. That's how, that's how they get started is through their doctors prescribing, you know, an opioid, you know? Yeah. And, and that's when I see people, started. when they can't that, get opioids anymore, they end up turning to heroin. The heroin. Yeah. Cause it's cheaper. Yeah. No. And How now did you kick it? 
Um, I asked for help. Yeah. And they provided it for me, you know. So I got help, and then when I about two weeks after I left the, the establishment, Chris Benoit killed his family. Hmm. So, again, a fellow Canadian, right? <laughs> so, like, the writing was on the wall. Maybe I just need to take a little vacation. Because get away from right. this place. When I went to Japan, I've been there ever since. What was your initial reason for asking for your release? That was it. It was Benoit. Chris Benoit? Yeah. Wow. Well, again, like, I went, to, I went to the rehabilitation center for four months, yeah. right? Yeah. And when I got out, I felt great. But then... You know, I mean, it was the biggest catastrophe in wrestling history. I mean, it was worldwide news. Yeah, sure. You know, so I said, okay, people, places, and things. If you're in a toxic environment or an environment doesn't, you know, suit you, you got to change it, if, you know. Yeah. When you asked for your release, did you have a plan for what was going to be next for you? Well, I didn't have a clue. You just wanted out. Well, but I knew I was going to do something in wrestling. Because I have very strong will and determination, right? And about uh, a day after I asked for my release, I was already booked in Japan. Wow. Uh, but here's the thing, and this happens with a lot of Canadians who get released from WWE or ask for their release from WWE. You're under an O-1 visa working for them. Now you can't work anywhere else in the U.S., which, I mean, that's, that's scary because it's an uphill battle to figure out how to legally work in the U.S. again. Oh, yeah. You don't have to. I haven't. I've had a good living. You're saying you don't need to legally work in the U.S.? I don't need to work in the U.S., period. That's true. Yeah. No. No, where there's you a will, there's a way. Yeah, you've been able to have an entire career in Japan. Europe. Definitely in Canada. Europe. Europe. Yeah. Sure. Wow. Yeah. yeah. Well, I, which I think is actually a testament to a lot of people in Canada who are going, if only I can break in. If only I can get a visa. Well, that's it. I got the exposure. I was very lucky. Yeah. I got, and, and now with the internet, you can, well, like Cafe de Rene, cheap plug. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's a way to promote yourself, right? Yeah, absolutely. But don't forget, the United States is what? Less than 5% of the world's population? That's a fact. Yeah. Right? You're on world, I was on worldwide television for four or five years. Yeah. And now with the internet, people, you know, I got a name for myself. It might not be the biggest name, but still. Yeah. No. At what point when you were working for WWE, does the excitement start to die down? You start to peel back that curtain and you go, oh, this isn't exactly what I thought it might be. Oh, it's like anything else. It becomes Groundhog Day, right? Mm. And then it's to the point where the only thing you care about is your check to see how big your check is every week. Yeah. And that's like... I don't think that's a reason to do anything. You know, I'm sure money, yeah, money is great. Don't get me wrong. But when that's the only thing you care about and you don't really care about the job, maybe it's time to do something else, right? But man, it must, it must have been so exciting for you because, you know, you get signed at 18, you debut at 19, you win a championship at 19. It's like you're marking, like checking all these things mm -hmm. off the list. And then at what point does it start to go, like just plateau? Mm -hmm. Well, it's 15, 16 years ago, right? I guess Eddie dying. Mm. Eddie dying was hard. And then uh, you see guys like Tess, for example, he breaks his neck, he gets fired. And then he did come back, but he wasn't, the, I'm just going to leave it at, he wasn't the same guy when he came back. Okay, and you see this. And I'm seeing that at a young age, you see this. And then you see like all your heroes, Mr. Perfect, Big Boss Man, Road Warrior Hawk. All these guys are dropping dead, left and right, left and right. And you think, well, is this, okay, that's great. Okay, I won this belt, I won this belt. Okay, I was number one, okay, but what's it going to be worth if at 38 or 40 I'm, I'm dead or crippled? You know? I got in, I made my mark, I made, did I make enough money to retire? No. Did I make enough money to invest? Yes. Is that what I did? Yes. Mm. And I, I'm proud to say that the investment I, I made when I was 19 in 2003, I've paid it off completely. So now I have perfect credit, 
seven figures worth of collateral and a steady six figure income. Yeah. Yeah. So in my mind, I won the game. <laughs> Is that six figures from indie wrestling right now? No, 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 no. From real estate. Oh, from real estate. Ah. Uh, I am I am right on the cusp right now of starting to invest in investment properties. Mm -hmm. And Renee, it's heartbreaking because you'll look at some of these properties and maybe they're selling, I'm just going to make up numbers here. Maybe they're selling for $500,000 and you, you see that someone bought it two years ago for 300 or 350. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and I'm reminded of the quote, the best time to plant a tree was 20 years ago. And the second best time is today. And I'm like, well, I guess there's no better time to get in it than now. Right. No, no, the initial investment, the initial investment I made was a little over half a million. Okay. Now it's worth almost triple that. So that's great. It's amazing. Yeah. yeah. Wow. We are the exact same age. And I remember we? Watch, Yeah, we're the same age. I remember watching you debut oh. and we're the same age. We're both from Canada. And I'm thinking to myself, I'm 19 and I don't look like that. So at what point in your teenage years did you start getting as insanely jacked as you were? I started lifting weights at 11. Okay. Now, yeah. now there's a difference, though. I started lifting weights at like 13 or 14. There's a difference, though, between lifting weights, mm. me, and looking like how you look, you. Mm. Mm. Well, I knew what I wanted to do, and I actually got a part because my father is very frugal, so he wouldn't buy the food that's necessary that you want to bodybuild because I would eat seven, eight meals a day. Okay, mm. I, would, I got a part-time job pumping gas at a gas station in a Canadian winter, so you know how brutal that is. Yeah, just to buy the chicken breast, uh, you know. Plus, it's genetics too. My dad looked like a young Steve Reeves. My mom looked like a foot fitness model when she was younger, right? So. I would spend three, four hours a day in the gym. I would skip school to go lift weights. Man. Yeah. So was your inspiration? I had no life. I had no life. Was your inspiration life. bodybuilders or was your inspiration pro wrestlers? British Bulldogs, the Road Warriors, you know, uh, Macho Man, the Ultimate Warrior. Mm. But then I, you know, I was kind of a smart kid because you know how Vince tried to start his own bodybuilding federation, right? Yep. So, you know, okay, this guy likes bodybuilding. So that's what I did. I trained and I got, well, I started wrestling when I was 14 for my dad. And then, uh, at 16 or no way at 17, uh, I trained for bodybuilding contest. I won the new Brunswick, the provincials. And then a week later was the nationals in Halifax, Nova Scotia. And I won those. So my resume, cause I, I didn't get hired strictly cause of who my dad was or my name. I got, I sent in a, a resume mm. i had you know national bodybuilding contest winner you know world qualifier all that shit because i was you no know, i was dead set on that was my goal was to make it to the wwf and i made it and what what i think is great about that is you, you've like reverse engineered the process here and i think there's so many people who are 12 13 14 15 16 whatever that want to be pro wrestlers and mm. Man, I, I hate saying this, but you look at so many indies and there's a lot of guys that are trying to make it who like never work out. And I don't understand if the biggest stars on TVs, TV are the guys that look a certain way. Why wouldn't you want to be in the gym as well? Yeah. Well, what a lot of them should do and they don't is train their neck muscles and their trapezius muscles mm -hmm. because all that bumping we do. But if you got a pencil neck, and you're taking all those bumps, it's easier for you. Once you break your neck, that's it. You ain't going nowhere. You, you think the big major feds are going to hire you? Yeah. When they give you that uh, medical exam, oh, you broke your neck? Okay, next. Yeah. You know? Oh. Look at it like any other sport. All the hockey players I've known and uh, guys who played sports, they all had to follow a diet and a regime and a training regime. You know? Wrestling yeah. is no different. Yeah. You know? The only difference is on, in wrestling, it's on you. When you're playing for an NHL team or an NFL team, it's like built into your day. You guys have to go to the gym. You have to work out for strength and conditioning. I think they do that in the uh, the Florida program now. In and the it, performance center, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think they're doing it like that. We did But then once you're on the road, it's like it's on you. Oh, yeah. 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 Get to the gym. 
You have to rent your own cars, get your own hotel room. I mean, a part of that's kind of cool because you have your independence and stuff. Yeah. You know, but some people like it more like in Europe. When we were traveled Europe with WWE, you have your own uh, team bus and you all stay at the, the high class hotels and stuff. And there was always gyms appointed to us and you had your meals paid. That was pretty sweet. That was a good time. Do you have any like residual injuries or residual effects from injuries now? Like when you get out of bed, does anything? Uh, hurt? <laughs> <laughs> Fuck, but I got like one brain cell left. Yeah. <laughs> is, that, is that why we're smoking whatever we're smoking here right now? CBDs. This is not THC, folks, although I am Canadian and it is completely legal. Uh, CBDs, yeah. I highly recommend it. Um, Memory loss, because I've had a lot of concussions, you know, and my teeth knocked out three times, my nose broken four times, I got dents in my head, yeah. but as far as body-wise, I mean, my shoulder's pretty screwed up, this one here from Goldberg, because he's a dick, uh, <laughs> other than that. That's a dislocated uh, collarbone, right? Yeah, yeah, but uh, we had a backstage a segment. With the flag, yeah, yeah. Hit me four times, like, son of a bitch. But that's the thing. Like, you don't want to show them that, you know, you're weak, right? You just go for it. You show them how tough you are. And, and you kept working through a dislocated sh uh, collarbone? It's called a cortisone. Oh, my God. Oh. Did you oh, yeah. end up having words with Bill after that and say, like, hey, man, like, my shoulder's all messed up now? Uh, no. Just... I mean, he knew that, uh, I think he has one speed go and he's so OCD that I, I think he was actually apologetic, but at the same time as like, he couldn't control it because mm. he's too concentrated on his character, you yeah. know? Yeah. I had Spike Dudley on the show last year and we talked about that spot that La Resistance did where he mm. took that bump to the outside with a table, which when you watch it back looks incredibly painful and yeah. spike shrugged it off like oh yeah no it's fine just it's like any other bump it's like that's, any what other he, that's what he told me after it happened and i was so apologetic man i called him that night in his hotel room to see if he was okay you know but uh that wasn't our idea like we didn't there's an unwritten rule when you first get to wwf especially at 19 you don't say a word you just shut up and do as you're told right but see, like bumps like that, they're too. Uh, there's too much room for error. Yeah, it's too dangerous. You, know? you have another human being. I don't care how big Spike's a small guy, but still, you try to in a live TV one take, and you know it's like, too much room for error. I, I was just blown away when he was like, "Oh yeah, that bump was no different than any other bump." He's one tough little bastard, I tell you. Whose idea was it for that bump? Bubba. Huh. Anything involving the Dudley boys, it was all Bubba. You did an episode of your podcast recently where you were basically like, yeah, F Bully Ray. <laughs> Nobody likes Bubba. <laughs> I'm not the only one. I'm just the one with the balls to say it publicly. Uh, I, I guarantee you there's nobody who's like, yeah, I'm going to work with Bubba Ray tonight. No, that don't happen. Are you saying as a person or as a worker, nobody likes him? Either. <laughs> Really? He's always been very kind to me. I've got uh, well, nothing bad to say about him. Yeah, well, I'll try working professionally with him, dude. Yeah. yeah. So there was, like, he lived up to his name is basically what you're saying. He was, in fact, a bully to you guys. Yeah. Uh, that was back then, man. Try that shit with me now. I, I, I won't fly. I'm a grown man now. It's so different there story. One, was there one specific thing? Like if we go back on YouTube and watch a clip, was there one specific match or moment where you would go, oh man, uh, that was bad? I don't think so. Like from a professional standpoint, there'd be times where he'd yell shit out in the ring. Like, dude, what the fuck are you doing? Like, that's why I don't rank him. I, don't, I do not rank him that high as a quality wrestler. I just don't. You know, I just don't. I mean, they had the little act that they the did. Dudley boys up there? No. Wow. That's right now. I mean, their little shtick that they did was entertaining. It was different. Okay. But, but as far as all time great wrestlers, no. 
Now, is this just Bubba, or did you have issues with Devon? D- no, Devon's actually a better wrestler than Bubba. Hmm. When it comes to actual wrestling, yeah, Devon's way better than Bubba. Okay, so if that's Bubba on has- one end of the spectrum of people you did not like working with. Who's on the other end of the spectrum of people who you couldn't wait to get in the ring with? Paul London. Every night. Uh, time I got to work with The Rock... That was pretty sweet. That was exciting. Steve yeah. Austin. Yeah. And then, um, well, I liked working with Cena. I liked the money. Yeah. Mm. But Paul London, as far as just because we're both young guys, and it's not like you had like a veteran trying to tell you to do this, that we could put our thoughts together and work together, you know? Yeah. It's great. What was it about The Rock or Austin? Like, I I think that, you know, you get into a position like that because you're great all around. But what was it specifically when you're in the ring with someone like that? Just the energy. Yeah. From the crowd. Yeah. Oh, those were the two that once their music hit, you would feel it. You would literally feel a wave Mm. from the people. I kind of, it's, it's, it's comparable to like, Saying you go to a Metallica concert, right? And they open the show and they hit the first the first riff of uh, Enter Sandman. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Or you're, you're Eddie Vedder and you're in the Madison Square Garden and the, the whole crowd is, is singing uh, Can't Find a Better Man. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. That's the kind of feeling you get. You know, For me, every time I hit the French Tickler, my little dance I used to do. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. That's when I knew I'd have the people, you know. Yeah. yeah. Whose idea was it for you to lean into your French roots and that to become part of your character? Well, it was the whole, uh, when the Afghanistan war started, right? This is when they renamed, renamed French fries, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The Americans. <laughs> <laughs> French was fries for, became freedom fries. Freedom fries. Oh, yeah. The Americans. Because the French didn't want to go to war. Yeah. You know. They're like, listen, man, we don't know the whole story and really it doesn't concern us. Yeah. Why are we going to go over there and die for? And then, you know. And then, I like to talk about this because remember a few years ago, I think it was in Marseille, there was like the ISIS or one of those terrorist groups uh, drove like a tank or something. And I think it was in Marseille, France and killed a bunch of people. Mm-hmm. Right? What did the French army do? Did they, they, they go and pray for help and ask everybody for help. No, no. Within 24 hours, they found out where those motherfuckers were. They got in their fighter jets and they bombed the ever living shit out of them. You see that? See the mentality, the difference. Yeah. They're, they're independent. They worry about their stuff. They don't get involved in anybody else's business. And really my mentality is the same way. I like to be independent. I like to concentrate on my stuff. I don't really worry about anything else. I remember being, it was so, in my blood. Confused. I remember being so confused as a Canadian. Cause I'm like, Wait a second. Rene and Sylvain are Canadian. Right. They're French Canadian. Just because they speak French, they now have to represent France. It didn't Imagine how sense. I felt. <laughs> well, that's the thing. It doesn't make any sense. <laughs> well, I mean, why did they make Santino Morello from Italy? He's really from Mississauga, right? He's from Mississauga, yeah. He just does Val- a great v- Italian accent. Yeah, Val-, Val Venus is from Toronto. All of a sudden, he's from Las Vegas and he's a porn star. No, because the mentality in the, in the United States and with Vince McMahon is that if you're, unless you're from America, you're not, if you're Canadian, you can't be a baby face. That's his mentality, right? Like when uh, Benoit won the title, go back and watch if, if, you, if you actually can now. Now resigning from Atlanta, Georgia. Well, that was everybody. Right after 9-11, nobody was Canadian. Everybody right. was residing in whatever their American residency was. Yeah. Yeah. Like Jericho, when he wanted, I think he was now residing from Tampa, Florida. They wanted to say, right. the only market would be the Toronto boys. Because Toronto's yeah, a huge Christian. market, right? Yeah. Like Edge. Christian, huh. right? Yeah. Because so Toronto's is, a huge market. So this is pitched to you that you're now going to represent France. And are huh. you thinking, well, that, of course, it doesn't make sense. But it's my chance to go work on the main roster. That's it. Yeah. You shut up and do as you're told, man. So like you can you really job. work on your French accent? Well, I had a stronger accent back then. Because 
when I first got to the United States, I was fresh out of high school, so I was always talking French. Like I told you, now I barely speak French at all. Maybe with my, yeah. my father, that's about it. No. Yeah. Because my mom was Anglophone, right? I don't know. It was just so weird to see that. But you're right. There was also the un-Americans that, that happened around that same time. Obviously, in the 90s, you had Bret Hart and the Hart Foundation, and they were bad guys simply because they were from Canada. Yeah. You know, if you look at Vince's track record, he always goes back to the same old formula. You know, USA versus the foreigners, right? Yeah, this happened with uh, Kozlov. It happened with yeah. Rusev. Yeah. I mean, we can go down the list. Yeah, yeah. Wasn't there like a... a you, uh, didn't they have a group? It was like uh, the the Rusev and then the uh, United Nations. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. See, it always goes back to yeah, and then whoever the, the American good guy is, you, it's always the same formula. Same but when shit. you break in doing that, how hard is it then to break out of that being your thing? That's it. it took yeah. me years. Yeah. It took me years. That's the thing. Like once you're on his television. That's worldwide. People are always going to remember you for that. Yeah. So when you try to break away from that, or if he owns your name, you know, there's nothing worse than uh, the artist formerly known as on a poster. Nothing looks more like rinky dinky than that. Dude. You know what I mean? Yes. But they're in their rights. They can, they can sue you or they can send a cease and desist to tell you not to use it. Right. So I mean, smart business on his part. For somebody who hasn't seen one of your matches since WWE, mm. who are you now and what's your character now? Who am I? <laughs> <laughs> no, I just go by Renee Dupree and I'm all over the world, man. Uh, the latest stuff I've done was in Japan for Pro Wrestling Noah. Yeah. And then I'm independent, so I do stuff for a fellow Canadian, Hannibal, for Great North Wrestling. He does shows all over Ontario. Uh, I usually travel through Europe and stuff like that. But again, with this pandemic, it's hard, right? So I really don't want to go to the United States right now because just I just, you know, I just heard there was like 5,000 cases in Massachusetts yesterday. That sounds very possible. <laughs> right? And now there's a new variant. There's a new variant, and then they just shut the J uh, Japanese borders again. Yeah. To all foreigners. So it's like, oh, it's never ending, man. What's the so Cafe de Renee on YouTube, everybody? <laughs> Please sign up and, uh, yeah, throw my YouTube pen. What's the character now? There is no character. I am my own character. I'm a character in itself. I wrestle. I'm with that. Yeah. yeah. I want to ask you about the tattoo on your left shoulder. I recognize the Canadian maple leaf, but what's, yes. what's next to it? Japan. Oh. Want to hear a story? I'd love to. <laughs> so I was at All Japan Pro Wrestling, right? Yeah. And uh, I was there for three weeks. And then uh, the, the seniors on the tour introduced me to sponsors. Now, a sponsor in Japan is like a fan who has a lot of money, and he takes you out. So they took us out to the Hard Rock. We went to the strip clubs. We did karaoke. And let's just say I had a really good time. So then I flew back to Canada after the three-week tour. And I'm with my buddies. I'm, we're drinking. I'm like, you know what, guys? Let's go for a tattoo. And we show up to this, like, shady, like, tattoo shop. And like, yeah, man. Japan. And then the next morning I wake up. I'm like, shit. <laughs> <laughs> but it's okay. I got next to my art because it, it, once I fin uh, uh, I was done with WWF, I hated wrestling, man. I was so sick of wrestling. I went over there. I fell in love with it again. Mm. I fell in love with the country. fell in love with the culture. So, plus I'm Canadian. So that's why that's there. If you fall out of love with wrestling, how could you keep doing it? Well, you just got to go to a different territory. Yeah. Yeah. The so only man, place, in my opinion, the only place that pro wrestling still exists is in Japan. Mm. And you'll find it on independent, you know, like the AEW stuff. I have, I have yet to watch a whole show. 
I think uh, I might review it on my YouTube channel, Cafe de Rene. Uh, <laughs> which, of course, I, translates to mean coffee with Rene, yes. Yeah, which is, yes, got coffee with me. Yeah. Yes. I, are you going to review an AEW show coming up soon? Is that the plan? Well, yeah, I guess. I mean, I do different topics. Like this week, uh, we did a fan vote on Twitter, and people wanted to talk to uh, want me to talk about Chris Benoit. So yeah. I did a forty five minute, you know, thing on him. And then I'm going to bring up different subjects that I find interesting, like uh, drug uses in wrestling, because I can relate to it, right? And describe in detail some of the stuff that goes on. You know, the, kind of like the dark side of the ring. You know, the, the, the subjects that most people don't want to talk about or scared to talk about. Yeah, I want to talk about that shit. You know? I think people are interested in that kind of stuff. So. I feel like you are now walking this thin line when you're talking about subjects like this. For, for an outsider looking in that might go, well, Renee's just jaded or Renee doesn't oh. like the WWE. Oh. No, I just tell the truth. Mm. You know? Mm. No, no, I can't. I, I have to. If it wasn't for their exposure on their television, you wouldn't be talking to me right now, would you? For sure. Yeah. I wouldn't have been able to do all the other stuff that I've done in wrestling and travel independently on my own. Thanks yeah. to that exposure. And that was, Christ, 17 years ago, 18 years ago. Crazy. Right. Um, but at the same time, it's like, I'm. Uh, Am I bitter towards that place? Well, I was resigned in 2011. A lot of people don't realize that. But I felt like I was lied to. You know, I couldn't I couldn't get in to the United States at that time because I didn't have my proper paperwork and I was told one thing and then when I went and got that stuff fixed and tried to contact them again, there was no answer. So I was like, you know, that was almost, that well, 10 years ago. So. If you I could go back and change anything about, it doesn't even necessarily need to be WWE, but you could go back and change anything about that time. Would you change anything? It's <sighs> hmm. a good question. I wish I would have been a little bit older until I, before I got on the road. Mm. Yeah. That, that lifestyle for anyone under the age of 21 is too much. Yeah. You weren't even able to drink. No. Oh. Yeah. Cause it's 21 in the United States. Yeah. And it's 18 in Quebec and 19 for most of the rest of Canada. Yeah. Yeah. But in the United States it's, it's 21. Yeah, it's 21 in the U.S. So what happens? You know, all the boys are going out. You can't go out? Well, I didn't want to drink anyway. I was trying to be, you know. The one time that I did decide to drink in my room alone, we were in the U.K. And I was 19, so I think that's legal, right? Yeah. But I ended up almost missing the flight the next day and got a whole bunch of heat. So that was the first and only time I did that. I didn't do it again. What was it that got you? Was it vodka? It was wine and two European women. <laughs> that, that'll get you every time. Every time. <laughs> but I think part of the allure of you was the fact that you were so young and so jacked at the time and seemingly so experienced for someone who was only 19 years old. Yeah. Oh, they had big plans, no doubt. They had big plans. And the thing is, if you were a little bit older, maybe your story wouldn't have been as impressive. Yeah, that's true too. That's the funny thing, right? I mean, you can never go back and change anything and hindsight's always twenty twenty. But if you were 25 and had all of the accolades that you had, maybe it wouldn't have been as great. Right. Yeah, it's true. It's true. I mean, I was the youngest until an eight-year-old beat my record. <laughs> What was his name again? Exactly. What was his name again? I don't know. No, I, now everybody watching this is going to go, well, what do you mean? Nicholas. I was there. I was at that WrestleMania. Were you? Nicholas. 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 Yes, I was at oh. that WrestleMania and I was looking at my friends going, I can't believe this. 
I think you need a rematch or you need to have a match with Nicholas. Right? Yeah, he's got to be, what, 11 now? Well, uh, yeah, I think he's hit puberty by now, so. Sounds like a fair match to me. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like it needs to happen. It needs to happen. Let's book it. Do you think about life after wrestling? You can't keep doing this for the next 20 years. Do you think about what you're going to do next? Well, I got the real estate, right? Yeah. So. Is that investing or are you also, like, are you, are you working as an agent too? Well, my family owns about 19 buildings and I own about two. So it's, yeah. it's, uh, yeah, it's yeah. <laughs> a comfortable income. That's yeah. A, that's pretty great income. Yeah. Yeah. No, I learned that from my dad. You know, my father said, it doesn't matter how much money you make. It's how much you save and invest. <clears throat> mm. Like I told you before, it's like, did I make enough to retire? Hell no. But did I make enough to buy a house? Yeah. Did I buy a house? No, I bought a real estate building. Yeah. I bought another one, then I bought another one, and then Yeah. You know. But I'm still gonna wrestle. Is, do you think real estate's the best investment that you could possibly make? I think it is. I mean people say it's like cryptocurrency, not in this day and age, but I don't know. The stock market, I don't know. I, I don't I'm not too knowledgeable about that shit. I, I learned a lot of the stock market's risk. a good long term investment. Right. Crypto Boy, that you could either become rich or completely broke from that, depending on what you buy. It's risky, right? Right. Yeah. yeah. But real estate's yeah. always going to trend up. People are always going to yeah. need a place to live. That's it. And they're That's making it. more people, and they're not making any more land. That's true. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, like the little town that I grew up in, man. Like since I graduated high school in the last twenty years, it's like tripled in size. Hmm. So that's why, like the the value of the, the land has just skyrocketed, right? Yeah. Have you always been this outspoken your entire career or your entire life? Maybe it's all the concussions, all the chair shots to the head. No, I used to not talk at all, right? Then I went to uh, the rehabilitation center and they forced you to talk. Mm. And then I think, you know, it caught on that it's important to communicate. Plus, I don't leave the house very often. So this is a chance for me to actually talk a little bit. You know. This in the podcast, yeah. Right? No, it's a great release. It's a great release, the podcast, yeah. What do, what do you do when you're not wrestling or podcasting or working out? <sighs> Staring at the walls. Mm, sounds exciting. No, I read, I read a lot of books. Okay, me too. Yeah. Uh, my father is 85 years of age now, and he... He lost his license because he's going blind <clears throat> and he's got dementia. So I have to take care of him because I don't know how long, you know, he's going to be here for. So in one way, the pandemic is kind of a good thing, you know, kind of a blessing in that aspect. Because if, if it was normal, I'd be traveling. I'd still be traveling all over the place, right? What's, what are you reading right now? Oh. Uh, are you familiar with Heroin Diaries? No. Nikki Six Heroin Diaries. Oh, okay, yeah. Oh, very nice. Very nice. Uh, what What would you say <clears throat> is the book you would recommend to anybody? Like, what's the book that you would gift the most to people? Fuck. Well, I'm into horror, horror, and I'm into like real, like bio, like real life biographies and stuff. You know? Yeah. I mean, when I was 12, I read Stephen King's It. I had mono that summer, and I had nothing to do, so I read the whole thing. That's a and big it. book, too. Yeah, it's like over a 1,000 pages, right? Yeah, it's thick. Yeah, it took me three months, but I read the fucking thing. Um, I'm a big fan of Motley Crue, so like their biographies are really good. Mm -hmm. uh, and here's the thing, right? I read Slash's biography, which is really good. But I tried to read, like, Chris Jericho's biography right after I read Motley Crue's biography. And I was like, this is fucking lame. And I just threw it away. Sorry, Chris. You just don't compare, dude. I like the real shit. Have you read Matthew McConaughey's book, Green Lights? No. Is it Highly good? recommend it. Really? It's so good. Good stories? Good stories? Uh, great stories. And also, like, just great life lessons in there, too. Yeah. He's been... Like, uh, 
journaling since the eighties and basically everything that's happened in his life is something that he like manifested years ago. Uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's a great read. Green lights is what it's called. Right. Okay. So I'll, I'll read, I'll read your book, heroin diaries, and you can read green lights and let me know what you think. All right. All right. All right. There it is. Who is the person in your life? Maybe it's a fellow wrestler. Maybe it's a family member. Who's the person in your life that inspired you the most as you were coming up in the industry? Mm, good question. There's so many, I can't just name just one. <clears throat> Cause I mean, I was like the ultimate fan, right? <laughs> like, when I was a little kid, I, I vacationed at Macho Man Randy Savage's house. You know, I had Harley Race staying at our house, and he would take me in his Cadillac to go get ice cream every day. You know, you know, Dynam I have the Dynamite Kid in his ring jacket at my parents' house in the attic, you know. So I've been around wrestling my whole life. You know? Yeah. But I was really hooked on uh, the Japanese wrestlers. Like, there's a legendary, famous god, Masahiro Chono. You know, he's like the godfather of Japanese wrestling. And, like, to this day, we're still buddies. Like, when I'm in Japan, I stay at his house and stuff. And, yeah. Like, I seen him um, as a little kid do all those cool Japanese, like, martial artists, and, which was different than when I was used to watching, the, like, the maritime Canadian wrestlers, you know? So that was that got me hooked. I'm so. guessing your dad was a big influence as well. Oh yeah, I mean I want to, I want to have the knowledge about the weight room and the, and the dieting and how important all that stuff was, right? Yeah, For, because because we had a gym in our house, so that's why I started so young, right? Eleven. Is there one piece of advice, maybe from him or from somebody else, that has always stuck with you? It's not, how much, it's not how much money you make in wrestling. It's how much money you save. Yeah. And once this business is like, it comes to an end. And once it comes to an end, it's one of the worst feelings in the world when you can't do it anymore mm. because it's such an addiction, right? I compare it to, like, why do you think, excuse me, Lemmy, he played till he basically dropped dead. Why do ACDC, why do the Rolling Stones, why do they still play Metallica? They have enough money. Yeah. Because they love it. And it's the rush. Well, that's the greatest drug, right? Adrenaline. It, <laughs> there's nothing like it. There's nothing like it. Which is why so many people, when the band breaks up or when they get released from the NFL or WWE, they turn they to another adrenaline rush. They self-destruct. Yeah. 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 Oh, yeah. How do you avoid? Yeah. How can you avoid that? I don't know. I yeah. really, you gotta find something else. But when this is your whole life, you know, it's hard. And it's it's hard. Like for example, like when I had that little thing in the ring with the Rock. After afterwards, how hard that was to come down. It was. It was. It was I was like stuffing cheeseburgers and, and ice cream, trying to get the endorphins in my brain up. Oh yeah. You know, or you try to find yourself a lady of the night. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah. Also sure. think of how difficult it would be to sleep that night. Oh, you don't. Yeah. You can't. No. And then you got to wake up early the next morning because you're off to the next town. Yeah. Well, yeah. no, that's the thing. Like you have a five or six o'clock, Usually they they book the cheapest earliest flights WWF so you gotta be at the airport at five a.m. You get out of the building at eleven maybe twelve so sometimes like why even bother getting a hotel room just go find a nightclub or a strip club or a diner and stay just there just find all. a lady of the night that's it lady of the night God bless them which city was the best city for ladies of the night <laughs> Chicago really Chicago I was oh, fully I expecting it. Las Vegas. Uh, oh, well, see, I never had to pay for it. Gotcha. Yeah. I'm French. Just pull out the wee, wee, wee. Bonjour. Comment ça va? I love that shit. But like, yeah. as far as entertainer, yeah, Chicago was the best for me. Man. Oh, yeah. Chicago. Oh, yeah. That would have Every taken me about 30 guesses to get. Oh, no, no. 
It's a wrestling city. Chicago is really, really good for me. Well, that's and it. Then, you're not you're not just getting picked up because you're a, you know an entertainer and you're French. You you know they're interesting because you're Rene Dupree and they just yeah. see you on TV. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Also, oh, yeah. you know, if if we went to a, a club tonight or a bar tonight, you would definitely stand out. Yeah, I guess. Oh, I can say on four or five different occasions, I would walk into a bar and girls would throw themselves on top of me. That happened about four or five different times. I'm not trying to brag. I'm just telling you sure. like a legit story. One time you know, I was with... Just because they're going, oh my God, that's Rene Dupree or oh my God, that guy's a wrestler. Mm, twice because of who I was. One time just because the way I looked. The one time was in Liverpool. I was at, you know, Brian Danielson? Of course. I was with Brian Danielson and Gangrel. Love those Liverpool. guys. Oh, great guys. So we're in Liverpool, England. We're working for an independent promoter, right? And I walk in and as soon as I we climb up the stairs to this and as soon as I get up there, this cute little English blonde girl just jumps in my arms and starts making out with me. You can talk to those two guys. They will they will back up the story. Yeah. Oh, that's a pretty cool feeling. Yeah, that's that's a pretty good night right there. That was a good night. Yeah, and it's yeah. not because not because I was I don't she didn't know that I was Randy Pre the wrestler. She just saw the way I looked. And, you know. The other two times in my hometown is because of who I was. Mm. And uh, one time it was in Louisville, Kentucky with, I'm not going to mention names, but she's a French-Canadian wrestler. Okay. <laughs> Fill in the blanks, bro. It's funny because kind of like the addiction you were talking about earlier yeah. with athletes or with rock stars, that starts to fade away as you know the older that you get. Yeah, and I remember yeah. asking my friend who was a notorious womanizer, and he got uh -huh. married at like thirty six. And I went, dude, like uh -huh. you used to be the guy who would like just line up girls and have your pick. What happened? Yeah. And I'll never forget it. He said I'd stopped getting the looks that I used to get when I was twenty five, twenty eight. And I went, oh, that's it, gosh. and that's a hard. Fill the swallow too. Yeah. And then instead of showing your looks, you got to show them your bank account. <laughs> yeah. Well, then they're sleeping with you for all the wrong reasons. Right. C'est la vie. Man, c'est la vie. C'est la vie. Mm. Renee, this has been such an interesting conversation. I had no idea where this would go. <laughs> We've covered so many different things. You said forty-five minutes. We're up to fifty-three. So, um, so we're gonna we're gonna wrap this up here. I'm so sorry. I've been enjoying your stories so much. Oh well, Cafe the Renee every drops every Monday. Uh, we're gonna have different subjects, and then if you want to go in the comments and you, you want a subject, my webmaster guy he reads them all. So just <laughs> let us know what you want me to talk about. I don't care. Yeah, yeah, Cafe Dupree on YouTube and wherever you're listening to this on a podcast platform. Yeah. I end every interview with the same question because I'm all about gratitude. I start and end every day saying out loud three things I'm grateful for. So for you, what are three things in your life that you're grateful for yeah, right now? I'm grateful for. Uh, I'm grateful for my mom and dad. That yeah, they're still alive. And... They support me. I'm grateful for my wife who stood by me through thick and thin. Uh, and I'm grateful for the internet because <laughs> I can try to stay relevant with my own YouTube channel. <laughs> and I'm, I'm grateful for the internet too. We live in two different countries. We are four time zones away and here we are chatting in real time. Isn't it awesome? And we're Amazing. both Canadian and we're both the same age. That's true. Yeah, except you're well well manicured, and I just don't care. Ah, you look great. <laughs> look at this wonderful ponytail that you have. Yeah, buddy. Oh, my dry split ends. Look at that. See? <clears throat> Shit. <laughs> Renee, thank you so much. Thank you, my friend. And congrats on the podcast. Well, we're only at like 315 subs. Hopefully after this show, we can get up to 3,000. <laughs> <laughs>
We, I, we can definitely double your subscribers with this interview. Well, I appreciate it very much. It's not much. a promise, but it's I'm, highly likely. Everyone's going to come through here. All right. Perfect. Good.